So, uh, I'm usually the person uh, behind the computer, not in talking in front of people. Huh. Um, I'm going to talk to you about uh, economical denial of service in the cloud. But before I begin, I want to uh, tell you a little bit of a horror story, a real-life horror story, horror story that can happen, happen to any business out there. Back in uh, 2016, Dean, one of uh, America's uh, most important DNS providers, got hit for 11 hours with a DDoS attack which peaked at 1.2 terabits per second. This meant that uh, important businesses such as uh, Amazon, banking, uh, GitHub, LinkedIn, could not be reachable uh, through DNS for 11 hours. They could only be reached f with uh, IP. Okay. When, uh, when it comes to losses, they lost 14,000 uh, of their clients, at least. Their clients lost money due to the downtime. Plus, they had bad marketing for almost a year. Okay. All of you have heard of distributed uh, denial of service attacks. But what is an economical denial of service? First of all, let's go a little bit on uh, what a DDoS is. Practically, it's... Uh, more than one computer attacking the same victim in, uh, with the purpose of making their resources unavailable. What resources? Well, or either the internet bandwidth or uh, the victim's hardware resources or some of the software tools they use such as the web server or even their application. Okay, so when you get hit by a DDoS, uh, you have a downtime and it costs you. But in cloud, there is a big problem. Apart from the downtime costs, you also have the cloud costs when you are hit by a DDoS. Why? Because of two factors. The contract you, ex you establish with your uh, cloud provider, which is called a service level agreement, and the auto scale feature. Practically, you buy software services from your cloud provider and you pay for what you use with probably a dynamic pricing plan, meaning that uh, if you use more resources or if you need more resources, automatically you skate to a higher level and uh, you might get taxed more. As a result, we could uh, conclude that a uh, distributed denial of service done on a business which is situated in the cloud becomes a big hole in their pocket. So it has an economical side. Okay. Uh, at this moment on uh, the internet, there are a lot of types of attacks. One of them is DDoS, is one amongst many. But why take it so seriously? Why nowadays? And it is simple. Because of botnets. Because nowadays it is extremely simple to have a botnet infrastructure hired for a reasonable amount of money for a few days and use it for spamming, for DDoSes, for malware infections. And it is so easy on the dark net to establish uh, botnets comprising of millions of zombies and have them silently waiting for commands. And uh, they have become more and more resilient to be, taking, to be taken down. Okay. And it is even more dangerous when it comes to uh, botnets because they now can be comprised also of IoT devices, practically any appliance that you have at home can have an IP. And there are a lot of users who unfortunately use the default settings 
uh, use the default password and don't make proper firewall rules in front of the IoT devices. As a result, for example, in 2016, 1.5 million wireless cameras were infected and used to carry out a one terabit per second attack. Another option are, uh, since 2017, all the devices, wearable devices you have, your phone, your uh, smartwatch, your tablet, anything that has an Android on it, for example. In 2017, the first Android mo botnet was created from a rogue application in Play Store, and it comprised of about 150,000 uh, phones. Okay. Taking into account that it is easier to have higher volumetric DDoS attacks, what are the numbers? From companies which uh, have the role of gathering uh, data fingerprinting from DDoS attacks, we get the following statistics. Daily, you have at least 20,000 DDoS attacks. Per company, per year, it costs them, uh, it costs them uh, at least $2.5 million to mitigate a DDoS attack. And what speaks most for itself is how much a DDoS attack can peak nowadays. In 2013, the highest peak was 300 gigabits per second, whereas in, as of 2018, it's almost two terabytes, terabits per second. Okay, a few examples. I suppose you all enjoy your Xbox, like, okay? So, do you remember the Christmas of 2014 when the online, pla online uh, platform wasn't available for two days? Guess why? Because of Adidas. Apart from that, many companies rely on GitHub. Fortunately, this year, uh, GitHub managed to mitigate a 1.3 terabits per second attack in under 11 minutes. But what, what if it was for a couple of days? And for fun, if you ever want to see a live, uh, if you ever want to see live DDoS attacks, you can go to digitalattackmap.com uh, and uh, here's a preview. So, you can have uh, DDoS attacks, which in the cloud get to cost a lot of money. Um, they are easier to be done and implemented at higher rates and more dangerous rates because of the means of botnets. But in order to protect against DDoS attacks, you first have to understand how they are done, what methods can they use, and at what layers of security do they attack? I'll give you top three examples. You can have login attacks, meaning that when you make a login request to a website, most of the websites do a hash computation on their uh, computer or computers. This means CPU usage. With enough login attempts, you can have their hardware Maxed out. Another example. Egress data attacks. Imagine the following scenario. So, you have a company, a website. And uh, you have it in the cloud, stored in, hosted in the cloud. Uh, at most, at uh, all the major cloud providers, you don't pay anything for ingress data, meaning uh, data that uh, comes to your website, but you pay money for egress data, meaning data, data that uh, gets, uh, goes out from your website. And uh, if you're in an expensive region such as China, if you're hosted in an expensive region such as China or Brazil, 30 terabytes of egress data per month can cost you at least $6,000. And imagine the following scenario. I am an attacker. I scan your website for resources, pictures, videos, stuff like that. I uh, go on the dark net, 
I talk uh, with somebody who has uh, a botnet. I pay some money and have them making millions of requests of downloading, downloading your resources, your pictures, your videos, or stuff like that. And from 16 kilo, uh, kilobytes a resource, done from millions of computers, zombie computers, you get to pay a lot of money. And you, have a, you don't have your resources taken down, but you have a big hole in your pocket. And the sexy neighbor next door this year have been reflection attacks. They uh, could have been done for quite a few years, but this year, they were the star of it. They won the Oscars. Because uh, with a reflection attack, they uh, managed to do the GitHub 1.3 terabits per second attack. And afterwards, uh, almost 2 terabits per second in March. And how does a reflection attack work? Well, you need the following. You need an attacker. You need an IP spoofing server which replaces uh, your source IP with the IP of the victim. You need some uh, public UDP servers which have a poor protocol. And you can attack the victim. What happens is that you make, for example, let's look at the memcached uh, attack, reflection attack. Memcache is a non-aligned server, free online server, where you can uh, uh, store uh, in RAM different objects, database objects or others, other objects. Okay, so how did they do the GitHub attack? They sent a request to a memcache server uh, with the source IP being the victim's IP, and the get statistics request. You simply ask the UDP server, the memcache server, give me some statistics. The memcache server answered to the source IP, meaning the victim, with its statistics. And the amplification factor, meaning how big, how times more, uh, how more times bigger were, was the response compared to the request, was 51,000. Meaning that if you send a request of one byte, give me your statistics, you would get, uh, the victim would get 51,000 bytes of response. Imagine this being done through a botnet of millions of zombies, of, com uh, of zombie computers. And uh, for fun, this is a chart with all the UDP protocols which can be hacked and how are they used in reflection attacks. The most used one is uh, uh, connectionless uh, LDAP, practically a protocol similar to Active Directory. You can query about uh, files and directories on the internet with HTTP requests, with uh, posts and get. Uh, it is the most used. Uh, its highest, uh, it has only a 70x amplification factor. So uh, the highest attack uh, in which CLDAP was used uh, peaked at 24 gigabits uh, per second. But uh, d you must know that uh, an average website can be taken down with only one gigabit per second attack. So it's enough to take down average websites. And then there you have memcache with yellow. It has a, a significant chart of the, a part of the pie. Okay. So at this point, um, I have explained uh, why a DDoS attack can become an economical one. I have uh, explained why are they nowadays uh, so dangerous and some, a few top three methods of conducting a DDoS attack. But in real life, a DDoS attack does not uh, comprise of only one method of attack. It's usually a multi-vector attack. It, uh, the attackers try to hit all the security levels a company, a website may have. And they have a strategy. From uh, DDoSmon, an analytics company, 
Uh, we have the current statistics. Surprisingly, most of the attacks done in 2017 and 2018 are not long attacks with high volumetric uh, hits. They are, in fact, short-lived attacks with, uh, with less than five minutes, and they have a small volume. Why would they do that? Just short hits. This is because the strategy is to create noise with the DDoS attack. The, com the company's security team is busy resolving the DDoS attack, and they have uh, the opportunity to make second bridge breaches. They can uh, take the opportunity that during the DDoS they can uh, penetrate your network and infect, that they can map your resources, or they can make data breaches. So DDoS attacks are a means to an end, the end being high hits in places where it hurts businesses more. Okay. When you have a business in the cloud, how can you protect yourself against DDoS? I have, pardon? This is one option, but you have many. I have one question. Those of you who have a business or know somebody who has a business online, hosted, not on-prem, uh, hosted anywhere, doesn't matter, on-prem on or online in the cloud. If you, how much does a poorly mitigated DDoS attack which results in one hour of downtime, really costs the business. How much money do you lose if you have poor mitigation and you are down for one hour? This is for everybody to answer to themselves. And for the businesses which are in the cloud, hosted in the cloud, or at least uh, part of them hosted in the cloud, there is one problem when it comes to protecting against DDoS. You don't have access to the physical network infrastructure of the cloud provider. On-prems, you could have bought uh, hardware equipment and placed them wherever you wished, wherever you considered uh, more uh, proper, for your business and infrastructure, but in the cloud you have no access. So how can you protect yourself in the cloud against DDoS attacks? You can only rely on DDoS protection as a service, either from your cloud provider or from third party. So, this is your only option. You have to buy DDoS protection as a software, as a service. And there are many options at your cloud provider also and third party also. But it doesn't matter where you take your DDoS protection in the cloud from. What the first thing that must come to your mind and you must take uh, good care of is the time to mitigation. Time to mitigation means the time it takes your business, your website, to uh, recover from the moment you detect an attack, how much it takes you to recover. And it translates in money because it implies your client's trust or lack of. It implies publicity, good or bad. It implies downtime or latency, or lack of, if good protection. It implies opportunities, or lack of opportunities, for secondary attacks, which can lead to data breaches, for example. And all of this translates to money. Okay. Whatever solution you choose for DDoS protection, the four most important factors to be kept in mind are one, reduce the surface of the attack. Two, 
be ready to scale. Three, architect for resilience. And four, and probably from my point of view, really, really important, register for life support. Automated uh, DDoS protection is uh, okay, but there are some situations where you might need an actual team of people going to the data center and solving the problem. Okay. Reducing the attack surface. What does this mean? So you have a business and you have it stored in the cloud. So you have some resources in the cloud. The main purpose and the main goal is to expose only the necessary resources. And if you have to expose a resource, protect, protect, protect. Protect it as much as you can. For example, in the cloud, you can have storage. You can have database resources. You can, if you have to expose them, you can protect them with access control lists from Amazon, for example. Ports, those ports which do not need to be exposed, don't expose them. Only expose those which need to be exposed through firewall worlds. When uh, VPC administrative console, so uh, when you get your own virtual private cloud, you are given an administrative console, which unfortunately, through which you manage uh, private keys to different instances in your private cloud, uh, and other secrets and resources. And uh, if somebody inside your company gets access to this administrative console, it might be a problem because all these secrets are in the clear. Recommended is that you use an identity access management service from the cloud provider, which is practically a proxy between you and your administrative console. You have access to all the keys and uh, resources, but they are hidden. They are not in the clear. Anti-spoofing protection. Uh, Google, for example, offers it for free. So take advantage of it. VC, VPC network configuration. Every big player in the cloud providing business has some have some, uh, has some thorough recommendations when it comes to your virtual private cloud infrastructure. Applicable to different types of businesses. If you have uh, a web business in the cloud, here is a recommendation. Look at it. If you have an online gaming business in the cloud, there is another recommendation. Look at it. If you have a hybrid cloud, so part of the business is on-prems and part is in the cloud. There are some recommendations regarding how to make communication between the two parts. Internal traffic. So inside your um, private cloud, another resource you have is your internal traffic. There are three main ideas. Only assign a public IP to the computer instances which need to be exposed. Also, you have many computer instances in the cloud. Use a NAT gateway. Control the number of and which computers go out the door to the internet. And the most interesting of all is the, intern, the use of internal load balancing, practically. Um, all the cloud providers offer you the service of load balancers. These are uh, servers which uh, balance the application or network load inside your uh, cloud to have even distribution between uh, computers, of load between your computers in the cloud. Imagine the following scenario. You're a company and you own a private cloud in London in some data stores, data centers and the private cloud in America, in other uh, data centers. The private cloud in London is where your public web service is hosted. 
So your clients go here when they want something from your uh, web, line, or web online service. And you use the private cloud in America for some reasons to store internal servers you need, your internal tools. In order for the online, public online service in London, you need to sometimes interrogate the servers in America to get some answers. And there are two ways. Either you make them public, and the communication between the front end and the back end is done through the internet, public internet, or you use internal load balancers, which make it possible for you to have communication between the two regions with, without going through the public internet. They are very useful because they, uh, in this way, your resources, backend resources, are hidden. Another uh, interesting uh, feature offered by uh, Amazon, for example, is the API gateway. Practically, maybe you're a business which exposes some APIs. So your clients make requests, API requests to you. You could either have your front end from your private cloud with a public IP and clients come directly to the computer instance in your cloud and make the requests, but uh, allowing them direct access to your uh, computer, cloud computer, might expose you or make you vulnerable to direct DDoS attacks. Or you could go through a proxy. The cloud providers, API Gateway. You have your front end on a private uh, computer instance, and all the communication with the clients go through the API Gateway. Just the API Gateway is exposed to those outside. The second one, be ready to scale. Use a contract with your provider which implies automatic scaling. Either you get, at need, you get more instances of computers or you get computers with better hardware performance. Employ elastic IP addresses. What an elastic IP is, is uh, a static uh, IP address which, in case the computer instance uh, to which is assigned to falls down, it is automatically assigned to another computer instance in your cloud, which does the same thing. This way, you don't have much downtime in case something happens with the first in computer instance. Also, when um, you do set up your private cloud, you have the option of choosing the templates, the machine templates from which your instances will be created. According to your business needs, choose the proper template. One with, for example, with a 25 gigabits uh, network interface and enhanced networking. Amazon offers you some templates which have a high I.O. throughput with low CPU usage. And the last but not least, use elastic load balancing. The server which balances the load between the computer instances in your cloud. You can either balance the application requests between computer, and this is an application load balancer, or you can balance the network load between computers. This is an example from uh, the load balancer architecture in uh, Amazon. Three, architect for resilience. When you create your cloud business architecture, take into account that you can be hit by DDoS and decide which DDoS services you use from your cloud provider. Some services are placed by the cloud provider at the edge of the cloud network, cloud provider's network, and they, can up, they are near, uh, nearer to 
um, internet providers, big internet providers, and they can mitigate uh, and absorb attacks uh, easier. And besides the protection you can have at the edge of the cloud provider's network, you can also have in place inside your private cloud DDoS protection. So if something gets passed through them, you have a second layer. For example, Amazon offers uh, a proxy for DNS requests. It is called the Route 53. It does uh, health checks and uh, sanitization. Uh, it also has a proxy for uh, content delivery networks. An API gateway. They are all placed at the edge of the computer of the cloud provider's network. And the uh, web, applic web application firewall, the one which checks and sanitizes malformed XMLA requests, for example, the HTTP requests. So you don't get a login uh, DDoS attack or uh, an XMLA DDoS attack. And they have recommendations regarding DDoS protection architectures for uh, all kinds of businesses. This is their recommendation for a web-based web -based business. You have the DNS, you have the content delivery network, and the web application firewall placed at the edge of their, uh, the cloud provider's network. And in-house, you're gonna have their DDoS shield. Okay, so you have to reduce the surface of attack. You have to scale, be prepared to scale. You have to think very, very thoroughly of the DDoS protection architecture and buy life support. But there are other things which you should take into consideration. Regarding your application hosted in the cloud or even on prems this uh, uh, is valid for both of them. Limit, limit per IP request count, per IP connection count, she per user request count. Choose a DDoS protection ser service which can both and properly um, protect against bad traffic and not take you down when you have or mitigate good traffic. What if you, if you have a website which becomes famous overnight? Will the scrubbing center uh, drop all the traffic coming from valid clients? When you buy a virtual private cloud in, uh, when you buy a virtual private cloud, you have to choose regions where data centers, where you, the data centers where you're stored are. Investigate that because if you host your cloud in a region with better uh, internet connection or in a region closer to your possible clients, you have lower latency. Also, when it comes to cho choosing regions, uh, you have to take into account the data sovereignty. This means the laws in the country where the da uh, data centers are uh, placed applied to the data you store there. Okay. Oh. Next. Uh, I have read the, the contracts exposed online by both uh, uh, Google, uh, Amazon, and uh, Microsoft, and they all have a shared responsibility model. This means the following. So, you're a company, you establish a contract with your clients in which you take responsibility that if you have a latency or downtime of more than let's say 1% or something like that, you can become accountable. And if you have your business in the cloud, there are many factors which you do not control. In this case, you have to see in case of a DDoS, who is to blame and who is to have the costs is it the cloud provider or is it you? They all have a shared responsibility model. See what that means. 
Also, it is good that you understand the difference between DDoS protection products. Amazon has at least, I think, eight or ten protection, DDoS protection products. Every product protects in a different location, either at the edge of the cloud provider's network or inside your VPC, and they protect at the different network layers. You can remember, you have DDoS attacks comprised of multi-vector methods. So you can get hit at many network layers. And last but not least, have a far -off look at the costs, even as sneeze costs in the cloud. I mean, you can have hidden, hidden costs everywhere, everywhere, even when you have an alarm in the cloud to notify of something, you get to pay for it. Uh, here's an interesting uh, print, screen from, print screen from Amazon regarding their DDoS protection products. Uh, you've got the products placed at the edge of their network, and you've got the products which you can place inside your VPC. And you can see what they protect, at what network layer they protect when you have to interrogate this and look at this when you choose an online protection product. Regarding for party, DDoS protection. It is an option indeed. Uh, remember that uh, you can use third party and they protect you for, uh, against requests done through DNS. But uh, somebody can discover your IP in the cloud and can hit you directly through the IP. In which case, the third party uh, actor won't be able to protect you. In which case, it's good to have a cloud in base DDoS protection. Two of the main actors are Cloudflare, the one you mentioned. They offer the whole suite of uh, protection services and data analysis and fingerprinting. And uh, you have Akamai, which is the one which protected uh, GitHub in February. If you see here, this is with green. It is the uh, attack, the amount, the peak of the attack, the volume of it. And with the red line represents how much they mitigated. It is a lot. They almost mitigated it, it all. And a small surprise, which might become an important one in the next few years is DDoS protection through blockchain. There is a company called Gladius. They are researching on this topic, topic. And I'm sure that there are other companies trying to make a viable DDoS protection uh, product through blockchain. And an example of a blockchain protection architecture would be the following. You have uh, millions of computers in the blockchain network. Um, everybody holds a ledger, as you know, a duplicate, uh, um, a duplicate of inf the information in the blockchain. And uh, let's imagine, and you have a lot of scrubbing centers, online scrubbing centers, which will work or a bullet, which will collaborate in working uh, in the blockchain network. And if somebody uh, makes a volumetric DDoS attack, the computers in the blockchain can record, uh, all the computers in the blockchain can record uh, the source IP, IPs used in the attack, and they can propagate it to the scrubbing centers. And you would have scrubbing centers scrubbing the DDoS attack nearer to the source, nearer to all the sources in the botnet used for DDoS. Okay, so this was it. Remember that you have a watch and other appliances at home. I'm not gonna make the joke. <laughs> and uh, anything that has an IP can and will be used against you. So. Thank you so much, Roluca. Questions? So, I think 
Okay, so you mentioned something about economical denial of service, and you mentioned something about egress traffic. Uh, and the, as a mitigation plan, there was this idea of you need to distinguish between genuine requests, say you, you actually hit the jackpot with your website, and um, actual uh, uh, denial of service. So is this something that is can be done in an automated fashion, considering that you have like a botnet uh, attacker that it's distributed geographically and it's quite difficult to <laughs> distinguish on a, on a geographical basis between uh, an actual attack and a, a real traffic. For instance, you mentioned the scenario with uh, downloading resources and you have, for instance, you invent the next Netflix or whatever, yeah. Facebook, and you download, you have a, a, a set of botnet um, uh, computers, zombie computers that download resources from, from your uh, web server. So how can you distinguish, is it possible to distinguish in an automated fashion that you have a, a real attack or is it something that you need to work on, on with, a, with a threat uh, analysis with a, with human human uh, operators so is it a feature or is it a bug <laughs> you have to <laughs> yeah to determine if the high traffic is a feature or a bug uh, from what I have researched uh, there are products which uh, do DDoS protection and uh, DDoS scrubbing through artificial intelligence AI and uh, there is a method I don't remember its name uh, it does uh, packet uh, fingerprinting when the traffic is uh, clean and applies those uh, features on DDoS situations. And there are other methods, there are researches online regarding uh, new methods of uh, determining DDoS from good traffic and mitigating it. Hello. Hey. Um, actually, I have just, uh, I have uh, not just one question, but a little, a few small questions. Okay. For instance, um, I don't fully agree with the, if you want DDoS protection, you definitely need as the last step protection as a service. It, it just, it, it, it always depends on the application you have and how you already and how you already deployed it and how you set it up okay, what am i doing wrong it's not wrong. so okay so for instance you you talked about uh, udp reflection attack for instance the N um, ntp and the memcache true uh, they both have high uh, amplification rates. However, they're extremely easy to filter at the ISP level. Yeah. For, for instance, all the unsolicited packets that come always come from dedicated ports. So yes, if the indeed. ISP can scrub that for you, since you don't expect traffic from that source port towards you, very easy to scrub. Of course, if the ISP is willing to work with you, and do that instead of just null, route, null routing the You're IP routing it and, to you and you having problem to absorb solved. it somehow. Yeah. But what if you have to absorb it, absorb it? Well, if you have to absorb it, actually, then the rules change. Then the most important rule is how hard can they, can they hit you? From what you I've have seen, seen hardware devices which crumbled at uh, less than uh, 100 uh, megabyte, megabits per second. And I've seen uh, servers that uh, true that was some time ago uh, they had 100 megabytes per second uh, megabits per second uh, interfaces and they handled it just fine and you have uh, defenses you have sync cookies you have um, um, from from the, the kernel level if you're at the load balancer level you can use a I don't, if you, if you deployed your application with a let's say a reverse proxy in front that that uh, reverse proxy may very well use a cookie injection, and uh, if there is the if the request does not have the expected cookie, just redirect it. Okay. In, in that case, the the answer is extremely fast, and it doesn't reach the backend 
uh, the backend servers. Okay, so the question is? Uh, so the question is, why do you need uh, protection as a service as the last step absolutely necessary? Unless you get hit with two terabits per second traffic. And how many, so this was part one, and part two is how many um, providers of uh, protection as service can offer that high traffic levels protection? Okay, remember that uh, nowadays DDoS, uh, and you're right, uh, wherever you want to read the news about the memcache attack in February this year, the 1.33 terabits per second, you will uh, see the obser observation that this was due to poor configuration. It could have been solved. Yeah, the default was to listen on that port. That's 112091. Yeah, and uh, actually it's 11211. And oh, second, okay. um, that, that that was just part. Of, that was just part of the problem. The the fact that on some uh, deployments it defaultly listened on that UDP port, which yes. it shouldn't have. And second, who the hell puts a memcache live on the internet without proper protection? So basically, those guys who uh, participated unwillingly in this attack, well, they kind of deserved it. Yes, but uh, you can look uh, interesti inter interestingly enough. If you look on Shodan and search for that port, I looked uh, last night. There are current, uh, in February, they said there were 1,000, 100,000 uh, memcache, UDP based memcache servers, and now there are, there are half. I think, I think I, I may be evil here, but I think I know the answer to, the, to that question why they are still there and why they keep get, stay, being there. Stack Overflow. I've read it, that's, that's how you install it and works. Yes, so. And just one very small question, I may have misunderstood, but did I, I Did I respond to the Yeah, uh, sorry, sorry. I, no, 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 I will not keep track of all the questions. So the first question was, uh, why would you need uh, uh, DDoS protection from the cloud provider or third party? <laughs> Uh, if you can just mitigate it with, if you can just prevent it, make attack prevention. Uh, Unless with, they hit you extremely with volumetric, hard. volumetric, yes. Um, if you can prevent it with good configuration. Well, for cases of, for example, volumetric hits. And for uh, some DDoS products like the API Gateway, Amazon API Gateway, Okay, they protect you against DDoS attacks for that uh, path, but they also hide your resources. I've told you that the current strategy uh, online regarding DDoS attacks is just creating a noise, not a big one, to have a hidden way to your website for data breaches, for malware infection, for ransomware, Okay. I think this ties a bit with what you said that uh, <clears throat> what if the attacker discovers your IP in the cloud and hits directly that instead of the gateway? Yeah. Well, that shouldn't happen because you should have a security group for exact. You should have. You can have security that, groups that, that only allows leads. from the uh, uh, gateway in front. I didn't go in all the details. You can have security groups uh, and uh, network access list, security groups for your subnets, but there are a lot of levers. What I uh, summarized here are a few, and I focused on uh, the products. But you should have protection at each level and at every, spec uh, at every step, including uh, when making uh, the choice of operating system on which you run your service. Windows uh, is different from Linux regarding what it accepts, what it doesn't accept uh, on network traffic. Also, uh, you, when you create your application independent, independently on where you store it, you have to think of these facts. You have to limit pipes at some point. Okay, and the second question. Uh, the, the second uh, which uh, providers can actually do you know that actually can provide service to an extremely high uh, volume attack? 
like one terabyte uh, Akamai, ter third party. So just them? No, not just that. I haven't, I didn't, uh, uh, Cloudflare is also a um, third party DDoS protection um, provider, uh, which has a whole suite of protection, not only DDoS. Okay. It is also a content delivery network proxy and uh, practically almost all that uh, Amazon offers. I showed you in uh, the picture, the architecture picture. Uh, Akamai is a good example. They mitigated, this is the graphic from their white paper on the February attack. Actually, this is how much they mitigated volumetrically. The red line being how much they mitigated. And of course, if you have protection at more steps, each step can absorb some of the, the attack and prevent some of the attack. If, you're, um, if you choose to go through a cloud provider's service situated at the edge in a region where you're near a big inter exchange, internet exchange, you're going to have a better rate of absorption than in other regions, or if you don't go through edge proxies. And also a bigger pipe for the mitigator to... Exactly. In order not to feel the pipe going to him. Exactly. How about smaller players like, I don't know, Encapsula or Black Lotus? I don't know. The second question, you had a uh, second, second question. question. I, may, I think I may have misunderstood or misheard. Um, you mentioned the data center in UK and the data center in uh, America. It was an US. example, made up yeah. example. So uh, the scenario was that the live public production website in UK was making sometimes was making calls to to US internal servers. Okay, in um, a, another region of the world. I may uh, I may not have played with uh, Amazon in a while now. But as far as I remember, the internal load balancer only works across availability zones, not regions. So I'm not very sure you can use an internal load balancer to, to send requests to another region. Did I misunderstand the premise or did they change something? It can be done? Well, another option would be just make a VPN between the sites and... You have many options. Yeah. Regarding costs, I don't know how much it, co it would cost a VPN versus uh, to make a VPN connection versus an internal load balancer. Okay, you had another question, three questions. I answered two. Uh, I think these were the three, part one, part two, and the second. Okay, uh, another question? Ah, there's somebody. Hey, uh, really enjoyed your presentation, really good amount Thank of you. information. Uh, so one thing I'm super interested in is monitoring and observability, right, of, of systems. Uh, but I, I didn't see it mentioned that much in, in this presentation. And I was curious, like, do you f see value in having monitors, dashboards of what's happening to your system uh, set up? Yes. I didn't, I uh, got it out from my presentation, but uh, I wanted to, I thought it would be too lengthy. Um, in my uh, slide where there were other masks, I had a bullet for DDoS uh, providers, DDoS products, which offer telemetrics. And uh, which practically, which make, uh, DDoS data fingerprinting, analyzing, uh, data mining, and stuff like that. I think it is of high importance, and there are some products which offer you analysis, DDoS Mon being one of them. Um, it's important because uh, when you learn from your past mistakes, you get to prevent better. When it, come to D when it comes to DDoS, there are three steps. Uh, first, uh, prevent then detect and then mitigate and they're cyclical so if okay you have done prevention detection and uh, you have managed to mitigate you get an attack you detect it you manage to mitigate it it would be really interesting to um, analyze the telemetrics 
uh, and uh, see where are your weak spots. And then you go again. You prevent with better products, with uh, lower uh, uh, weak spots, and again, you get hit, you see where you... It would be good, besides telemetrics, uh, to have also security auditing. That's not automated, and you have to pay a lot for it. Thank you. You're welcome. Another question? Yeah. Okay, thank you so much, Raluca. You're Let's welcome. applaud. That was super intense for a last presentation in a conference, so thank you, you rocked. <laughs>